Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good, good morning. morning. How is everybody? Good. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here and uh, honored to serve under our senior pastor, Marcus and Natalie Avalos, who have been here for many years, planting amazing seeds in this community. I just realized that this June makes seven years I've been at this church. Isn't that crazy? If y'all know me, that's, you'll know that's quite miraculous. Uh, I'm a pastor's kid and I vowed to never work at a church, but yet here I am. So I've been here seven years and man, it's just been amazing. Um, I came, I just really felt like the Lord told me to come and serve Pastor Marcus and Natalie. And so, you know, I'm grateful for all you people in the church here, but I'm really here for Pastor Marcus. So uh, it's been great to, to, to be here. With, uh, and I get this record now. I think I'm the longest serving staff member ever that he's ever had. So I need a, I need a medal or something. Wear it around. Most humble seven. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to continue our series this morning. We're calling it Summer of Joy where we're looking at the book of Philippians, which is called the book of joy, which if you know anything about the book of Philippians, it's really ironic because the book of Philippians was written by Paul when he was in prison. He wrote this book and you got to remember something. When Paul was writing this book, he didn't know he was writing the Bible. Like, can you imagine if you knew you were writing the Bible and you were in prison? You're like, well, at least, at least there's some payoff at the end. I'm writing the Bible after all, right? He had no idea that he was writing the Bible. He was writing a letter to the Philippian church, the people at Philippi, and it would ultimately become our Bible. But he, he had this sense of joy within him as he was writing from the prison cell. And the, the power of this is this whole message of this book is it doesn't matter what's going on around you. You can have joy inside because joy comes from a deep place within you and it comes from walking with Christ. So we're going to talk about that today because uh, we're, we're going to talk about knowing what your why is, why you do, why you're doing what you're doing. So when I was in high school, um, I discovered by about 10th grade that I am horrible at math and science. Uh, I got a D in every algebra class I ever took. And mostly that was just because the teacher was so sick of me. They wanted to move me along and an F would have meant I was back in their class. There was only one math teacher. So they moved me along. So around 11th grade, end 11th grade, the guidance counselor called me in and she said, uh, Joelle, you need to pick your classes for next year. And she said, what science do you want to take and what math do you want to take? And I was like, I don't want to take science or math. And she said, you have to. Now, I'm not one that goes along very easily with stuff. And I immediately go, well, why? And she said, because you have to. I said, well, that's not an answer. Why do I have to take science and math? I'm horrible at both of them and I don't want to do it. And she goes, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do music and I want to travel the world. She's like, well, I think you probably need a backup plan for that. So what science and math do you want to take? I said, I don't want to take science and math. She said, well, then fine. You're, off, you're not going to college. You're off the college track. I was like, oh, okay. So right there, you know, she didn't tell me about community college. Like they'll let anybody in. Eventually they even let me in, right? I graduated community college. But uh, they didn't tell, she didn't tell me that. She made it sound like it was the end of the world. So I said, okay, great. Well, I'm going to go take a Spanish class, an advanced Spanish class. And I found a teacher, a lady who had went to Juilliard to teach me music theory that year as an independent study. So I took that that year. Well, end of senior year, she called me into her office and she's like, all right, where are you going to go to college? And I said, you told me I couldn't go to college. You said I was off the college track. And she goes, well, yeah, but where would you go to college if you were going to go to college? And I was like, well, I don't think I want to go to college. She's like, yeah, but where would you go if you wanted to? I said, why does it matter? She's like, because we need to put it on the bulletin. and Everybody has to have a college they're going to go to after they graduate. I'm like, oh, so you want to look good. Like everybody's going to college afterwards, right? Like, yeah, your mom goes to college. But anyway, that's, that's a Napoleon Dynamite quote, right? So now I'm totally off track. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyways, long story short, I came back to the U.S. I was in Guatemala at the time. I came back to the U.S. And the funny thing was the college I guessed at is actually the college I ended up graduating from, but I had no desire to go to college when I said that. Came back, got a job working at Southwest Airlines because I wanted to travel. Unfortunately, they made me work too, which really got in the way of the travel. But uh, so I worked Southwest Airlines and I started playing music and I went up to Nashville. I wanted to get involved in playing drums in Nashville. And then I got up there and I got around people from Nashville and I was like, people in the music industry are horrible, horrible people. 
I do not want to be involved in this mess. So I gave up on that dream of music. And now listen, there's some good people in Nashville, I'm sure. I think, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I did not like that vibe of the music industry. And uh, so I was like, well, I'm going to travel. Well, eventually I realized, you know what? I do, I do know what I want to do. I figured out what I want to do. I, I didn't want to go to college and waste a bunch of money if I didn't know what I was going to do. I'd seen so many friends that went to college and got into huge debt because they didn't really know what they were doing. They changed their major seven times. Well, I finally decided I want to go into working for the State Department in the Foreign Service Office. These are the people that work at embassies around the world. You have to take a test, but first you have to get a degree. So I went and studied political science. And I focused on, I actually ended up Southeast Asian studies was my expertise. A little random fact about Joel. Uh, Southeast Asian studies and political science. And then I was preparing to stay for that. But around my junior year, because I managed, <clears throat> I managed to squeeze four years of college into five and a half. Uh, around my junior year, I was burnt out. And I remember calling my dad one day because I had been working full time and I'd been going to school full time. And I remember calling my dad I'm like, dad, I'm out. I'm quitting. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something else. I like, well, you got to remember your why. Why are you in college? And I was like, I don't remember why. I don't know why. He said, well, you said you wanted to go, go to this foreign service officer exam. I was like, oh, that's right. And I have to have a degree to go apply for that test. That's why. And that gave me just enough motivation to stick it out through college. And I ended up doing that. I took the foreign service officer exam. I failed. But anyway, <laughs> and now I'm a pastor. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, that, that was a reminder of me because yeah, how many of you know that, man, when you've got a big goal in mind, it's so easy to lose hope and lose sight of the goal when life gets hard and when life hits you in the face. And you get to a point in your life where you're like, man, you, you, got all, you have, start out with all this energy and excitement, but life just starts to hit you over and over and over again. And one day you, you maybe wake up and you go like, what is the point of this? You, you remember how excited you were to have kids? And then they came along, and for the first seven, eight, ten years of your life, you're like, this was supposed to be fulfilling. All I'm doing is cleaning. I clean rear ends. I clean noses. I clean mouths. Every orifice. I clean messes. Is my whole life, is my sheer existence cleaning? Is that what this is about? And you lose sight of what you're doing with all that cleaning. How many of you can relate to that? If you're a mom, you know, it's like, yeah. It's like, I just, I feel like my, my job is a cleaner. I, I could have done that without kids. But you forget the big purpose of what you're doing. You're actually raising up soldiers for Christ in this crooked and depraved generation, which they're going to shine like stars in the universe, as it says in Philippians, we'll read later. You forget about it. And sometimes you just go, man, I, what's the point? You lose sight of it. Some of you, man, you're fighting an addiction. And you're so tired of fighting this thing because it just always comes back with a vengeance. Just when you think you've gotten a beat and you're, you're, you have this thought in your head, you're going, what's the point? All my friends, my other friends just gave in. Like, what's the point? Maybe some of you, you've been fighting to lose weight and you just cannot shed the pounds. And you're like, you, you did it because the doctor said, if you want to live longer, you've got to get rid of that weight. And you're going, what's the point? I just can't shake it. it. It seems like a victory I can't win. Some of you have been trying to get out of debt and financially, every time you think you're ahead, something breaks on the car or a washing machine goes out and bam, you're back in the hole. And you go, you start to go, what is the point? And after a while, you start to get really depressed and discouraged because you had this great vision for your life, but then you look around at the reality of it and you go, what's the point? There's no way I'm ever gonna get there. Anybody relate to that? Feeling depressed, discouraged? I know you do. So here's my first point this morning. This is the key premise for this whole message of everything we're gonna look at that Paul says. If you aren't motivated by a purpose bigger than yourself, you will give up when life gets hard. This came to me as a very stark reality during COVID. Because you remember, I love to travel. I love freedom. We didn't have any of that during COVID. And about nine months into it, I remember one day I was sitting, I was standing in the kitchen cutting an onion, crying a little. And I remember thinking, life stinks right now. If I didn't have my daughter and my wife who need me, I think I'd just be like, Lord, just take me now. Now, I wasn't suicidal or anything, but I had this thought. I was like, if this life is what it is right now, if this is the way it's going to be, if I didn't have something bigger than myself to live for, I don't know what the point would be here. But I know that my daughter needs me. And I know that my wife, I think she needs me. I hope she needs me. Uh, right? I'm just kidding. She needs me. She doesn't even know she needs me, but she does. 
that, it was a stark reality that, you know what, right now, if I'm just looking at my life, I don't really like how it is, but I know that I'm, my, my daughter and my wife need me, and that gives me a purpose for living. When you've got something bigger than yourself to live for, it gives you meaning when life gets hard and you just rather say, well, what's the point? And give up. So that's where one of the things I talk about with all my coaching clients, I've been doing leadership coaching for years, and I always tell them this, you always want to start with the end in mind. Proverbs 29, 18, it says this. It says, where there's no vision, the people dwell without restraint. When you don't have a picture of where you want to go, you'll just do anything. You'll just take anything. You'll accept whatever comes along. And what I've found is most of us have a better picture of what we don't want in life than what we do want in life. You've seen what you don't want. And so you spend most of your life running from what you don't want. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be insignificant. Whatever the I don't is. But the problem with this is you can run from something in any direction. You can only run to something in one direction. And most of us spend most of our lives knowing what we don't want more than what we do want. And we're running all the time from anything that looks like what we don't want, but we never have a clear direction of what we're running towards. And the only way you're going to get the clear, clear direction of what you're running towards is if you're running towards the right thing. And that's living your life for Christ, which is where Paul picks up the section of Philippians that we're going through today. He says something pretty intense. He says, guys, remember, he's writing this from a prison cell, not exactly a posh prison. He's not living in some white collar executive prison where they're bringing him three meals a day. Like the dude is probably chained to a wall in a dungeon. And he writes this. He goes, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a, again, Paul, are you saying you'd rather die? And he's saying, well, it's, it's gain. Like I recognize that if I'm living for Christ, the great moment of glory is gonna come. My ultimate goal, and this should be the goal of all of us, is when I stand before him, he goes, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on into your eternal rest with me. Actually, it says, come into the joy of your father, is what the verse actually says. Come into the joy of your father. And that should be the goal of all of us, that we're living in such a way that God is gonna say, hey, you did it well. Pleasing God should be our highest goal. So he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm, uh, he says, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? He's like, yeah, if I stay here, I'll get a lot of stuff done. Which is funny because he's in prison. Still pretty optimistic. I'll still get a lot of stuff done. Yet, what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two because I desire to depart and be with Christ. Like that would make life a lot easier. Which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through me, through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. So what he's saying here is he's saying, listen, my ultimate goal is to just be with the Father because I'm living for him. But I realize that I'm also living for you guys right now. And this is the big picture. Because the big picture is living for God. But man, it's really easy to lose your purpose with the big picture sometimes. And you have to go for smaller goals. In fact, one of the things they say in goal setting is Dave Ramsey says this, actually. He says, if you've got a huge debt in front of you, pay off the smallest debts first. Because you'll begin to feel the momentum of conquering those smaller goals. And one of the things they found in psychology is most of human happiness comes from pursuit and overcoming of a goal. Most of our happiness comes from that, is seeking something and moving towards it. So he's he's saying this, he's saying, look, my ultimate goal is to be with God. But right now I know to live is Christ. And the way that I, I, my small goal right now, the thing I do is I live for people, which fits perfectly in line with something Jesus said when the rich young ruler came to him and he said, hey, Jesus, like there's all these commands, what's most important? And Jesus says, there's two of them. And the second one's just like the first one. He says this, he says, first, you gotta love God, the highest aim. He said, and the way you do that is by loving people. He says, basically, you prove that you love God by how you love people. Now, I don't like that. (laughs) Because, you know what? Most Most of the time, I feel like people are getting in my way. Did you know, do you know how easy it would be to be the pastor of a church if it weren't for all of y'all? I'm joking, of course, because you are the church. You go, some of you think about your business. You're like, man, can you imagine how great our business would be if we didn't have customers to deal with? 
But yet, would you have a business if you had, didn't have customers? Nope. Because people are the point, y'all. People are the point. And when you have something greater to live for, and the great thing is living for God, but the way you show the greater thing you're living for is by living for the purpose of loving other people. That's the smaller goal. And as you focus on loving those around you, that's where life takes on a whole new meaning. And that's where Paul says, he's like, yeah, it'd be a lot easier for me to just go be the Lord. But I know that right now, the way I prove that I'm living for something greater is by how I love those around me. So I started thinking, what is it that a lot of us are living for that ends up falling short for us? We know we need to be living for people, but what I've, what I've found, if you've hung out with me for more than about three minutes, you know I, I harp on this. There are three things that drive all human behavior. It's the desire for safety. You want to know you're going to be cared for financially, emotionally, physically. The desire for connection. You want to have relationships with others, connection, um, feeling a sense of value from others, and a sense of empowerment. We are made to need all these things, but we're made to get them in God's love. But what ends up happening is most of us, because we felt a lack of this at some point, we end up living our lives getting these things, as, our, as trying to get these things as our motivation for living but they will fall short when life comes hard. So the way this plays out, for some people, this plays out in seeking money. For some people, money and safety are equated. I'll be safe if I just have enough money. I'll be buffered from whatever possible things could happen, downturns in the economy. I'll be safe if I have enough money. But yet, that will always come short. And oftentimes, People will have their greatest regrets because they were pursuing money over relationships. And they got all the money, but they lost all the relationships. And make no mistake, your greatest regrets in life will not be money regrets. They will be relational regrets. And how many guys, men, I'm talking to you, how many of you are in the name of providing for your family and because you feel a little bit incompetent in how to deal with your teenage daughter, you'd rather spend time at work making money because it's a lot easier and you feel like you've got some value there. And yet your relationship with your daughter is separating because you got your wrong priorities. And it's going to fall short because one day that job's going to go away, but your daughter's always going to be your daughter. And you can fix it now or pay for it later. The great thing is right now you've got a chance to fix that. So you invest everything in that. For some people, connection is money. Money leads to connection. I was with, had lunch with a guy recently and the first time I met the guy, he invited me to this extravagant meal. And he's just had all these people there and he was paying for everything and getting everybody whatever they wanted. And I thought, this poor, lonely man, he uses his money to buy friends. And I guarantee you on the other side of it, probably when he's all alone, he just wonders who loves him not for his money because he's always buying, he's buying things for people. For some people, money means power. If I have money, I can get people to do what I need or I can hire people to do things for me. Money will always fall short. Because you'll never have enough money. Because if you're living for money, the answer to that answer that is always going to be, I just need a little bit more for me to feel safe or connected or empowered. For some people living for power, man, if I can just get enough power, it'll give me, it'll give me safety. I'll be protected from people. If I can just get promoted at work to, to the point where they can't fire me, I'll be safe. For some people, the power is, is uh, connection is power. Relational connection makes you feel power. I know a lot of people. I've got a lot of connections. I know people. And you feel like that's your power. For some people, power, power and empowerment. That's your power, right? Autonomy is another thing a lot of people motivates them. This is a challenge for me. I like to think I'm a rock. I'm an island, but I'm not. That's an old song by Gar Simon and Garfunkel. For those of you who are going, what was he just doing? Some, autonomy is like, man, if I can just make myself independent of everybody... I won't have to worry about anybody for money or for love. It's just me. I'm just here by myself. And that means safety for some people. Because you know what? If I'm, if I'm autonomous, nobody can hurt me. They'll never hurt me again because I am okay on my own on this island. For some people, autonomy and connection. The goal here, and my wife pointed this out. She says, for people in this corner over here, the connection thing, autonomy is all about, if I can see autonomous, you'll never reject me. I won't have to worry about being rejected by you because rejection is your greatest fear. And for some people, autonomy is, is a way to feel empowered. Approval. Some people live for approval. That's safe for them. If I can just get a people's approval, I'll be safe. If I can just get people's approval and feel loved. I was talking to a, a guy the other day, uh, a lady the other day, and her husband was upset with her because she kept inviting this family over that they just weren't clicking with. 
And the guy's like, I don't like hanging out with this family, but my wife keeps inviting them over. And I said, well, why do you keep doing that? And she goes, I just know if they hang out with us long enough, we'll win them over. And I was like, maybe, but probably not. Because listen, it does not matter how wonderful of a person you are. There are always going to be some people that do not like you. Straight up, I am a cute, lovable little fuzzball. <laughs> Did you know there are people that don't like me? Seriously, like there's some in this church that don't like me. They're like, oh, Joel's speaking? Oh, I'm not going to show up this week, right? <laughs> it just happens. And you know what? I could spend all this energy trying to win them over, and I probably never would, because you'll never say the right thing to the wrong person. But you'll never say the wrong thing to the right person. And it's okay if not everybody likes you. Sometimes your personality just grades on people. Now listen, if people are constantly harping on you because you're doing something sinful that's destroying you, that doesn't have to do with them approving of you. It has to do with them, you doing something that's stupid and it's hurting you. But there are gonna be some people that just, your personalities just don't work together and that's fine. You don't have to win them over. Just be true and walk in integrity to who God made you as long as it's not sinful. Be true and walk integrity to that. And listen, some of you are gonna about to be liberated here. You don't have to be liked by everybody. It's okay. <laughs> Sometimes approval looks like empowerment. If I can get people's approval, I'll just rise in the ranks. And you compromise yourself over and over again trying to get people's approval. Some people, it's positivity. Just, I gotta stay positive no matter what. Staying positive, positive, positive. So Jesus comes along and he says, look guys, I know you're worried about your safety, connection, and empowerment. But I'm telling you this, if you seek those things, you're always going to come up lacking. So he says this, I know you're worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. He says, See, everybody runs after that. Even the pagans are going after that. And your heavenly father, he knows you need them. God knows what you need. He knows you need safety, connection, empowerment, but he's saying you're going to get that only in me. So he says this, if you want those things, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. He says, you got to aim at something higher. You're aimed at this little stuff down here, if I can just get this. But eventually, that's going to come up short when you need some meaning and purpose in your life. And you may have all the money you were looking for, but if you have no relationships, you're going to come up empty. If you've severed every relationship and destroyed every relationship around you in pursuit of money or autonomy or connection or whatever it is, you've lost it all. That's what Jesus said. He said, what, is it, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul in the process? He says, you got to be seeking to live for a higher thing. And you live to please God and hear him say, well done, good, faithful servant. And the way that we walk that out and the small goals that we set out are always people related. How do we love those around us? Because people are the point. People are the purpose. And that gets hard because people are really difficult. That's where Paul, he says this. I love this honest statement by Paul. He says this. And if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Like guys, basically this whole thing we believe is really dumb if Jesus didn't rise from the dead and if there's not hope that we will eventually, even though we die, be resurrected into life. And he says this, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people the most to be pitied. This is a fascinating statement because he's saying, look, you're trying to be like Christ. That's your goal. You're trying to like, God, I just want to be like you. But if you're forgiving people who hurt you over and over and over again, if you're loving people over and over again and they're not showing you love back and you're not getting their approval, if you're trying to be generous and people are just taking advantage of you and we don't have something greater we're living for, an eternal purpose we're living for, we're idiots. We should just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die, which is the way a lot of people live. If this is all there is, get the most out of it you can. But we're not just living for this. We've got an eternal perspective and we're saying, no, I'm living for on the other side. When I stand before God, I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And the way that I prove that I've lived for him is how I love and care for those around me. And that is how we find meaning and purpose. It's in finding it in something greater than living for our own self. But so many of us, we, get, we feel those desperate need to have those things of security, sense of connection, that sense of empowerment. We're seeking those things and God's saying, nah, listen, lift your vision. Seek me, aim at the highest possible good, me, and all these other things will be taken care of. Because he says, look, everything that's happening in this world, he says it's preparation for ruling and reigning with him in eternity. 
That's where Paul says, he says, it's preparation for this eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. So he says, fix your eyes, not on what's seen, because that's temporary. Fix it on what's unseen, because what's unseen is eternal. And then we, we prove that we value what is unseen by loving the scene around us, what we see with people. And that's the hard part about it. But it's also where we find the most fulfillment. Right before my grandpa passed, the hospice nurse came into me and she said, hey, I want you to go to him right now. And I want you to tell him, Papa, it's okay for you to go. I'm gonna be all right. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. She said, go say that to him. I said that to him and she said, you don't realize how many people, the thing that keeps them alive is the sense of desire and need to care for other people. And when you release them from that, they can go on. And I thought, man, that's powerful. It's that idea, again, that when you're living for something bigger than yourself, it gives your life meaning and purpose. And I think that's the message we always have to remind ourselves of is, man, I'm living for God, but the way I show that I'm living for Him is by living to serve and love those around me and doing my best with that. That's my goal for you guys. And that's what Paul's saying here. Let your life to live be Christ and then to die will be gain. But for right now to live as Christ and to live as Christ means you're focusing on loving those around you with the love that Christ has given you. People are the point, y'all. Yeah, they're frustrating. They're very difficult. You're very difficult, but they're the point. That's the point of everything God has asked us to do. Lord, we thank you this morning that you have given us a, a purpose that's greater than ourselves. When we live for you by showing love to others, you give us a sense of meaning and purpose. And even when we lose the point for a while, we go, what is the point of this? I pray you would bring us back to that central focus, that our goal is to, say, to hear on the other side, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So I pray for those this morning, Lord, that man, they're feeling depressed. They're feeling the weight of the world. Maybe they're feeling purposeless, meaningless. Lord, I pray that you would infuse in them a sense of what their why is. What's the why that they're living for? And I pray that you would just remind them it's living for that day, for eternity. And then we live for that day by loving those around us as best as we can, even when it's hard. And I thank you, Lord, that you're the one who empowers us to do that. If you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Jesus, I'm gonna give you a chance to do that. I'll say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God's gonna transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness. He's gonna forgive your sin and he's gonna set you up in eternity with him. Let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way and we turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you right there under the do it again sign. Man, you guys, I pray you have a great week. Stay cool. You are dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>